Thanks for the introduction. I'm Camille Crittenden and serve as the director of the Data and Democracy Initiative at Citrus, which I'm here to tell you about this afternoon. I also serve as director, deputy director of Citrus overall. So I work with a faculty director there uh, who's an electrical engineer. And through Data and Democracy, I also work with a, a faculty director um, on that. So I thought in the next, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes or so, I would tell you about Citrus as an organization briefly to kind of situate the Data and Democracy Initiative within the scope of that work, <clears throat> and then give you a couple of examples of what we're doing uh, in the Data and Democracy Initiative that might be of interest. So here's what we're just going to talk about. Citrus is an acronym that is quite long and unwieldy, standing for the Center for IT Research in the Interest of Society. It was founded in about 2001, back when there was more money in the state government than there had been subsequently. Um, it was actually an initiative by Governor Gray Davis, who gave substantial funds to establish four such multi-campus initiatives, um, research centers throughout the University of California. So Citrus is one of four. Uh, also QB3, which is based at UCSF which stands for the Quantitative Biosciences Institute. We collaborate with them a fair amount. And then there are two based in Southern California, one on nanosciences, uh, CNSI is the acronym, and another uh, focused more on ICT innovations, Cal IT2, which is based at UC San Diego. So we're a multi-campus, multidisciplinary research institute. This is really the essence of it. We're based at UC Berkeley, but we have affiliations with Davis and Merced and Santa Cruz, um, and particularly at Davis with the Health Center. So they have a large program on healthcare technology, and we work with them, the medical school, the nursing school, um, to build out some of the projects that we do in the healthcare area. The multidisciplinary piece is also really important. We're situated, if you're at on the Berkeley campus, within the engineering computer science sort of area of campus on the northeast side. And a lot of our affiliated faculty members come from those disciplines. But we also have strong affiliations with people in art practice and public policy and law. And we really want to take this sort of team-based, multidisciplinary approach to solving some of the most pressing problems. So we really take seriously the interest of society part of the Citrus acronym. Um, and try to bring the various disciplinary perspectives to bear on solving those problems using te technology solutions. We have four main research thrusts at Citrus. Healthcare, um, and there are a number of themes that kind of run through them that you might see use of sensors, wireless sensor networks for a lot of these issues. Um, trying to engage uh, citizens to change their behavior in some ways by using game type applications or other interactive applications. So we see that in the healthcare sector, in energy, in intelligent infrastructures, and in data and democracy. The Data and Democracy Initiative is probably the most recent one to be established at Citrus. As I said, it was started about 12 or 13 years ago, and UC Berkeley has had a long history in developing new technology for energy applications and in some of these other um, hard technology uh, hardware applications. The Data and Democracy Initiative was started just a couple of years ago, and as Vivek mentioned, I came over from the Human Rights Center. That was my um, more immediate background. Um, I was there for about six years, and while I was there, I was really interested in applications of technology for human rights research and advocacy. So it made sense to me when the uh, Citrus was trying to start up this um, aspect of their mission, the Data and Democracy Initiative. I knew some of the faculty members who were working on it, and I was really excited to come over and um, work on that in a more concentrated way as the, the staff <laughs> director. This is the mission that we're looking at um, trying to, to develop, develop tools to support dynamic relationships between digital media and democratic practices. So this is a huge space. Obviously, there's a lot that we can do here. But <coughs> one thing that I um, excuse me, really appreciate being where I am within the engineering school, I look at um, institutes you know, such as the Program on Liberation Technology and others on university campuses at Columbia and University of Chicago and elsewhere. And it seems that um, programs devoted to the internet and society broadly, like the Berkman Center or something like that, are frequently excuse me, within public policy or law schools. 
So what kind of sets the Data and Democracy Initiative apart is that we are so closely affiliated with the engineering side and we can actually create tools and create applications that hopefully will support some of the other initiatives that um, people are working on in these other areas, more on the policy analysis or um, research side. So our hope is that by um, some of the projects that we're working on that we're really aiming to foster a stronger sense of civic participation, citizen engagement in all kinds of issues, um, not just political issues, but also social and cultural and environmental issues, um, public health, that they really have applications across a range of disciplines and concerns, trying to create these tools that are going to give people more of a sense of empowerment, of sharing their ideas and priorities, as well as giving policymakers and leaders a better understanding, a more nuanced understanding of what their constituents might want or appreciate. So we have a small advisory board. These are some of the people who are on our um, on the DDI advisory board. Um, people from government and you know technology thinkers, people who are active in in various um, NGOs. And then this is the team. It's a fairly small team, just uh, on the staff side. Three of us. Ken Goldberg is the faculty director. You might know of his work in robotics, or um, he's in the IEOR, Industrial Engineering and Operations Research side uh, at UC Berkeley. Myself and we have a postdoc, Brandy Nanaki, who recently joined us. Then we have just a handful of faculty members. As I mentioned, we have affiliations with the four campuses within Citrus, and so we really wanted to be sure that we had representation from those campuses on our leadership um, advisory group, the faculty council. Thinking about what DDI's contribution to the interest of society piece of Citrus's mission is, the things that we're thinking about are creating new tools for civic engagement in a whole range of topic areas, as I mentioned. And so we see the possibility, you know, huge possibilities to, um, for application across a number of subject areas. The problem is never that we have too little to do. <laughs> you know, there's always far too much to do. Um, and we're really grateful for some of the partnerships that we have, um, including with Liberation Technology Program and others, uh, implementing organizations on the ground to help us really test out and develop some of the tools and apps that we're, um, that we're creating. So I'd like to spend um, the next little while talking about two specific projects. One is called the Rashomon Project. This was developed, it was really sparked, you'll see. It's the Berkeley campus picture. Yes, exactly. I should say that this is the Mario Savio here on the right. Um, this is say 1964 probably, um, 65, um, home of the free speech movement, so you'll see the connections to that movement there. The idea of the Rashomon Project, as it says in the subtitle, is using the power of people's cell phones that have, you know, everybody has their video cameras on their cell phone now, um, to be able to aggregate uh, individual perspectives of a single contested event. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that there. The, the project was really um, sparked by, you probably remember this footage from the fall of 2011 uh, at the UC Davis campus. This was when there were a lot of protests around student tuition hikes, and there were sit-ins and activism uh, um, regarding that, and the campus security force took extreme action by pepper spraying these seated activists. So what's interesting about this is also to note all the documentation of it. Um, so it's not just you have the protesters on the ground, you have the security forces who are taking action, but then you often have observers with either their professional devices or just cell phone cameras. You can see the guy holding up in the back um, trying to get footage of this event. <laughs> yeah. So what happens to that footage after it's taken, or those photos? People tend to upload it to their own site. You might put it on your Facebook page, or share it on Vimeo, or uh, YouTube. Um, but it's hard from any single account to really get a sense of what the full uh, situation was. So what we wanted to do, it, so here's an example. You have um, you know, all of these different uh, places where it might be, be uploaded. What we wanted to do was to be able to aggregate these and to pull together in various ways, and I can go into the technology behind it a little bit, um, to pull together the various videos and align them. We were originally hoping that we would be able to use the metadata in the files to have some automation in it to align 
the different files so that um, they could be synchronized. You can line them up. You can stop at certain places if you want to rewind and have it make a, a short loop if there's a particular moment of interest um, that you would be able to see from different perspectives what was happening. So the interesting thing is that this has seen support not just from the activist groups who you know, always want to show how they're um, you know, being perpetrated against by the, by the security forces, but actually the campus security was interested in supporting it too because sometimes they felt like their perspective was not getting out. Um, that they had been taunted or harassed by the activists and so you know, maybe that prompted a particular action that came out in some other um, form. But regardless, this was a way for us to get a, a more rounded perspective and not just a single view of what happened. As it turns out, it has been a challenge actually to get uh, multiple videos of people to send them to us. That was the original idea that we would have people send us their videos and then we could kind of curate it and put it all up within a short time frame. Um, that's the easiest way to get the metadata out of the files is to have the original raw footage because if you post something on YouTube or elsewhere, often that data is stripped out. Turns out that's a little bit difficult. It takes a lot of coordination with the activist groups themselves, you know, communications in advance, trying to know if there's going to be a certain point of contention that would benefit from a display like this. So what we have done is to figure out a way to scrape the files from YouTube or to collect them files that have already been posted elsewhere. And the automation piece that comes into it there that we're playing with is to try to use um, audio cues to try to align them um, and then do some fine tuning of it. So you can find out more about it at the Rashomon, rashomonproject.org. Um, we have a website. We've gotten some nice funding from the Knight Foundation um, to do some work on it. it got some funding also through Mozilla. They had a challenge that we were able to um, participate in. So it's, it's been an interesting um, experiment using video footage for um, trying to promote democracy, freedom of expression. We think there would be a lot of applications. Oh, looks like I got cut off a little bit there. Um, you know, the, the examples that we have here are domestic, but clearly there are many international applications, especially with the proliferation of cell phones in developing countries or the Middle East, you know, places where there is a lot of unrest. Um, in Syria, some really interesting work has been done, as you might know, trying to match up um, social media footage, so from cell phones and such, with also with satellite footage and with accounts on the ground. Um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have been doing some interesting work in that regard as well. Um, so we're hoping that we could tap into you know, some of the, the applications there. When I spoke at an opportunity earlier, we were thinking about, well, so what are the opportunities here with this ubiquitous kind of um, video footage, not just from citizen cell phones now, but also from um, monitoring, security camera monitoring and um, this proliferation of surveillance video. Some opportunities are to aid law enforcement in getting evidence. Um, that's one of the goals, actually, of the Rashomon Project, is that, um, especially because of my background at the Human Rights Center, I'm very attuned to the International Criminal Court and what could be brought to bear as evidence in some of these cases. And the more versions of a single story you can put together, it can serve as collaborative um, corro corroborating evidence. Um, so it, it can help to uh, reduce costs for witness testimony, say. Um, if you can have multiple video accounts, it's not as expensive to try to bring live witnesses. It's not as um, dangerous for the witnesses if you can get multiple accounts through video. It's still a little bit untested in the courts. Um, there is not much precedent for using video as evidence, and it at least until now, has been has required a lot of authentication almost frame by frame. That's been the sort of level of due diligence that the defense has required um, because they're always going to challenge what the, what the evidence is. But we're hoping that if we can get the right kind of footage and be able to display it in this kind of persuasive way, that it will be useful in a criminal court or even an um, investigative commission kind of context. These are some other um, benefits of using this kind of cell phone footage. Sometimes, it, as you know, the traditional media or broadcast media might not be able to reach into places, especially in repressive 
um, repressive environments. And by having this kind of citizen footage, cell phone footage, it can often reveal things that you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise. I saw this morning on the news actually um, the cell phone footage of a BART police taser using a taser on someone on the BART train. So in that case, it was just a single, you know, single footage. But it, you don't have ABC News there with the camera. You have someone else who is a BART passenger, in, sort of like the Oscar Grant example too of a couple of years ago when he was killed um, on the police on the BART station in Fruitvale. There are a number of video accounts of that as well. So we've been working with some other. There are advocacy groups like We Cop Watch. Uh, that uses trains citizens to use their cell phones to capture images like this and so we've been working with them trying to aggregate some of the footage that they have and to make our tool useful for them as well. Some questions about surveillance video, um, not necessarily the um, cell phone video, but just overall to think about the privacy issues. I mean this is really an issue also in protecting human rights activists and we considered this in the Rashomon project as well. Initially, we had played around with some of the automated face blurring technology. Um, the, there are folks at Witness, which is an organization that does a lot of um, training for using video in human rights kind of context. Um, and they have gone to developing very strong metadata standards in order to try to strengthen the, um, the use of video as evidence to say, you know, we have all this information about exactly where it was taken, when it was taken, you know, what perspective using the accelerometers and stuff to try to see exactly how, how it was taken. Um, in an earlier iteration of what they called Informacam, that's their product, um, they had another version that would blur faces called Obscuracam. And so we were trying to work with that on face blurring. YouTube also has a face blurring um, service that you can apply. Um, we have left that behind for the moment because we also realize that as much as we can try to protect the identities of the people involved, if there's multiple versions of footage of people out there, you're gonna, still going to be able to identify people. Um, and in the U.S., that's probably less uh, of a danger, but in the Middle East, it can really be a danger or other places where there's... Um, you know, really oppressive governments who would be interesting, interested in retaliating either against the perpetrators, uh, against the activists themselves, or against their family members, perhaps. There's also interesting um, research about what the effectiveness of surveillance video on preventing crime. You would think that, okay, you put up these traffic cams or the security cams, that um, it's going to diminish crime levels, but there's been some interesting research that says that that's not necessarily the case, that maybe it just shifts where the crimes happen to more private um, or out of out of view areas, so it might it might reduce the crime in this spot where the cameras are, but unless you're going to have cameras everywhere, it might not be effective in um, reducing crime overall. This is an event that we had um, with some other folks from YouTube and Witness, uh, the Cop Watch organization, back in December. So. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this, it's also on the Citrus YouTube channel, um, the video of it. It was about an hour and a half or so event that we had um, last, last December in 2012. So before I go on, I might just stop there to see if you have questions or um, thoughts about the Rashomon Project. Oh, this one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question about the value of open source technology. I mean, we always um, value putting that capability out there and making it available, presuming it's for good. But um, I can see why that would be of concern as well. Can I do it now? Not, it's not entirely available now. I think some pieces of it are on GitHub, um, but it's not 100% available. I think you would have to really know what you were doing to, <laughs> to, to find it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the other day I was in White's Plaza and came across
Crocs some youngsters experimenting with an omnidirectional virtual reality camera that you hmm. say right out in Palo Alto they're busy putting them together. Okay, and so video is about to evolve into something far richer uh, involving 3D models. And yeah. so what the vision you're chasing will become the compositing of multiple vantage points mm -hmm. um, omnidirectional 3D imaging modeler. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how do you folks see that coming? And uh, are, 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 I mean, is there potential collaboration with the folks right out here in Palo Alto? And yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's one of the slides that didn't make it into this presentation. But that is the idea for um, a future version of the Rashomon project: is to work with scientists who are doing this kind of 3D modeling, because to recreate a scene could also be very useful for commissions of investigation. Um, also, to try to map. Um, using some of the tools in the uh, cell phones, the perspectives or the directions of the, the people who are taking the footage, that would be an interesting way to do it too, to get sort of the bird's eye view of, of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Other thoughts? Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, the challenge with this, I think our, our first instinct would be to use it in these kind of um, social justice instances where there's a discrete time uh, that we could focus on. And that has been a challenge, actually. Like, we tried to work with the Occupy movement some. Um, and unless you know that there's going to be a, a confrontation, um, often you get hours of footage where of people marching or yelling. And you know it's not really all that useful to, to have it in a format like this. Um, so we would have to consider what the benefit is of having a, a kind of prolonged um, documentation. What's your intention for where this recreation ends up in the Western Museum's organization? Or how do you plan to present the footage if you're on your website? Uh, well, it would be open to news organizations or to advocacy groups, or it would be on our website. You know, we would be able to make it open to journalists. You know, hopefully, broadcast journalists, maybe with an online component, that might be a good place for it. Um, if news organizations are covering an event, they could say, "Go online and see." You know, this full fuller recreation. And the nice thing about it too is that it's interactive, so you can select different views if you only want to see three out of the five or whatever you can select those um, and also select according to time so if there's a time that you want to zoom in on you could do that too so are, are there any hooks into Google Maps so that you can drop it to be it so if you wanted to contextualize a larger demonstration problem and there were four or five incidences across the demonstration and the timeline is mm -hmm. with this and you wanted to sort of like see the bigger picture are there currently hooks into Google Maps so that you can place them at their location? Not at the moment, but I'm glad that you mentioned that. And going back to the um, other question, too, about the social media kind of interaction and being able to tag things or um, to offer comments on them, I think that's also a vision for the future, is to make it more interactive in that respect as well, so that people can go in and, um, and make comments about what, what's going on, to have this sort of collective product in the end. There's a um, Google timeline project that's very, very well with what you're doing. Uh-huh. Yeah, that would be an interesting application. Good. So uh, another project I'd like to tell you about is one that is trying to get at how to collect good ideas. Um, and the specific application here is ideas about how to improve st the state in this case. Um, state governance. Um, this goes back to an earlier project called Opinion Space that I'll talk about in just a moment. But a lot of companies have been trying to get at this idea of collective intelligence or crowdsourcing ideas, um, trying to get a sense of people's um, suggestions and priorities for their companies or their organizations or whatnot. So these are a few of the, um, of the groups that have been trying to tackle this idea. Frequently, these are um, cast in lists. So if you have, go to IdeaScale or any of those other kind of um, 
tools you can put in your suggestion and it gets put on a list you might or like the Yelp idea you know you get a list of comments and you some are starred some are more popular etc but it's still basically a list Facebook you know you get thumbs only thumbs up <laughs> you don't even get thumbs down on Facebook you get thumbs up so this is a way um, to express your opinion it's really um, a binary kind of system so we were hoping to get at a more nuanced kind of view um, and more granular view of people's opinions and ideas out of this um, problem came this application called Opinion Space that our faculty director, Ken Goldberg, has also developed at UC Berkeley. And this is a, a multi-dimensional um, tool where people can go in and rate certain ideas on a slider scale. So not just yes or no, but um, how effective do you think this idea is, how innovative do you think this idea is, and to use a slider to indicate that rather than, than yes or no. The idea behind it is that for organizations, you can get a much broader sense of the feelings of your community. Um, you can also offer the opportunity for the community members to provide their own input. And then this is the thing is that they can then have community members rate others' ideas. So there's this kind of feedback between peers, between people who are um, part of the same community. Also through the data analysis on the back end, things that are rated highly um, kind of float to the top. So you're able to separate the wheat from the chaff a little bit better than you can if you're just looking through a list and trying to see which ones are highly rated, less highly rated. For community members, it helps to feel like you have a say in um, you know, whatever the topic might be. One of the implementations of Opinion Space was actually at the State Department a few years ago. Under Hillary Clinton, she had this Office of Innovation. Alec Ross was one of our um, advisors on the DDI um, advisory board, and he was one of her senior advisors and helped us to get this implementation at the State Department where we had a number of policy issues listed that people could go in and say, I think this is important, more important, less important, and then to put in their own suggestions for their priorities of where they felt that the uh, U.S. foreign policy should be focusing. People say, well, you know, how do you weed out the flamers and trolls and you know people who are just going to go on there and say nasty things about the US government but the thing about the system is that it is a little bit self-regulating so if people go in and uh, will likely rate down the um, comments that they disagree with and rate up the comments that they feel should be paid attention to so it helps to to separate that out a little bit and have the community kind of be more self-organizing Right, exactly. I mean, there was a probably light moderation in terms of use that you had to you know, say, but it also does help do that a little bit more automatically by letting the community decide. So of course, so then the Obama administration, he's been quite gung-ho about using new technology and social media for reaching out, starting with his campaign and, and previous campaigns as well. Over time, we've um, morphed the uh, opinion space platform into what we're calling the collective discovery engine. Um, so letting people use the power of the crowd and crowdsourcing to come up with good, good ideas about um, whatever the topic might be. So it comes up with this nice visualization. In this instance, these uh, come across as blooms. So you would be able to go in and click on any one of these blooms or you know, bright circles. And those are the various ideas that you would be rating then. And so the more highly rated ones are going to be bigger and more prominent. And the less highly rated ones are going to be smaller and sort of fall, fall to the wayside. What does the X and Y it's multi-dimensional, so it's not exactly X and Y, but um, it is collapsed a number of dimensions. But it does still represent um, the affiliation between opinions. So people whose opinion are closest to you are going to be show up closer to your bubble than people whose opinions are farther away from yours. So how do I discover which opinion is mine in this? Uh, I'll show you. We'll come to the, to the present iteration, which I think is a, a little bit cleaner and easier to understand. So in this case, we're actually developing what we're calling the California Report Card. And it's based on this idea of rating the government or rating any institution about um, how well they're performing. It came from this idea of the Citizen Report Card, which has been around for quite some time, um, and is a similar kind of thing using the familiar metrics of A through F um, to grade. 
and this is a, an easy, easy thing to grasp, but often the report card is coming out from some authoritative organization. You know, they've gone out and they've done the research, they've done the metrics on how well organizations are performing according to certain benchmarks, but it's not a community-based kind of exercise. It's more of like a top-down kind of exercise. Um, so what we have in mind is something that's a little bit more grassroots and where um, students or community members themselves are going to be providing the grading and the feedback. So we've come up with this metaphor of CAFE, the collective assessment and feedback engine that we're deploying here in this instance in California, but we're also hoping to scale internationally and find applications um, in humanitarian contexts or others um, internationally. Some of the challenges there, of course, as you probably recognize, are in the technology itself. So what about in these low resource communities who might not have smartphones? Um, can we create something for, uh, say, SMS type feature phones or even voice recognition um, to be able to use a similar kind of platform? These are some of the areas that we're looking to, to deploy it. The Philippines, we've been working with a group there at the um, De La Salle University and um, then in California with Gavin Newsom's office, which I'll tell you about right now. He's in California. So we're working with Gavin Newsom and his office to deploy this for California. Um, it launched about three weeks ago or so, and we've had about 1,200 people participate so far, and about 400-something people have left comments and remarks. Um, and I'll show you how, how it works. Um, we've had somewhat of a relationship with Gavin Newsom's office. We had this conference back in September, Can Open Data Improve Democratic Governance? So this is another area that I'm very interested in thinking about and helping to promote research on. We don't do a lot of research on open data specifically at Citrus, but um, I like to hold conferences and <laughs> bring people together who are doing smart work um, around this just to get people thinking about it. As you probably know, uh, Newsom himself is quite a proponent of the use of new technology and social media for government. He wrote this book, Citizenville, How to Take the Town Square Digital and Reinvent Government. And so he has um, really championed the possibility of this type of grassroots interaction through new technology and new media. So here's the California report card. Um, and I encourage you now or at a later time to <laughs> take out your smartphone if you like to and check it out. Um, CaliforniaReportCard.org. It's been designed for mobile devices. So the, the um, main URL, if you go to the full, um, uh, full screen, maybe if you're at your laptop or desktop and see the, the full website. But if you go to your mobile device, you'll see it's been optimized for that. So what it is, it has two parts, as I described a little bit earlier. Um, there are six issues that are facing California. Um, quality of K through 12 education, implementation of the Affordable Care Act, access to services for immigrants, and a few others. Um, so then you go in and you give it a grade, A through F, and once you've given your grade, then you are able to see the median grade. So you, you immediately get some feedback about where your opinion stands with reference to others. You're also able to skip the question, which is also interesting information for us to have. Um, so once you've graded those six topics, then we ask for your zip code. That's really the only piece of uh, demographic information that we ask for, it's your zip code. And then you go in and um, rate a couple of suggestions as to what the topics should be for the next version of the report card. What should the government be paying attention to? Um, what would your priorities be? So once you've rated two suggestions, then you can go and offer your own suggestion. And then if you give us your email address, we will send you alerts when other people are rating your suggestion. So your suggestion gets put into the pool of suggestions that other people are going to rate. And the reason we ask for your zip code is that the first kind of set of suggestions that are presented to you are those that fall within your zip code. So you can get a sense of um, what your neighbors are thinking about, what their priorities are. So this is really how it works, this little um, storyboard of, that we uh, created for this. You have ideas, you want to express them, here's the app itself, talk about it. You can, uh, you can go back and change your grade, um, which we're also tracking. I think it will be interesting to see the data that results from that. You know, how are people going to uh, adjust their grades once they see the median grade? Might you change your mind? Um, and then there are some nice statistics and visualizations of the data analysis. 
So this is basically what it looks like. You can see the heritage of it a little bit in the circles and the coffee cups, you know, um, thinking about the cafe idea. Um, but this is the, the iteration that we have now for, for version 1.0. Um, you go and you click on a mug to rate the different ideas, and then you get your own mug once you've rated a couple of versions. So then here are the statistics, and this is what I love to see too, is that it's broken down by county. So you can see how many people are participating in the various counties. And we've done some really um, fairly aggressive outreach to the outlying counties in Central California and the Inland Empire um, of Southern California to try to get more representation from those areas. Of course, we're going to have a fair amount of representation from the Bay Area just because that's where our social networks are. But um, you know, tell your friends in Southern California and elsewhere uh, to go and, and help us rate, rate the state on these various issues. So you see the map, and then you can click over it and see, according to the various questions, how the different counties are rating it. And then you can also see how the grading um, sorts out in, in these different um, tables. The, it's interesting, I think, to also on the skip mechanism that I mentioned, that the one that's most frequently skipped is this access to state services for undocumented immigrants. So you know, what is that going to tell the government? What is it going to tell Gavin Newsom and his um, colleagues? You know, maybe they need to be doing better outreach, or maybe um, people just don't know enough about it to, um, to have an opinion about it. On March 20th, we're going to have an event about this to review some of the results of, the, of this. And I hope that you'll come. Its registration is open and it's free. Um, and if you want to go and participate in the uh, report card, we're also going to invite the people who have the most highly rated suggestions to come and present their ideas at that event. So I hope that'll be really engaging and, and interesting to learn about what people are thinking about. I also wanted to mention just before that event um, and to thank the Program on Liberation Technology for co-sponsoring this event on um, visual privacy and surveillance. This is another one that we're hosting in early March, March 6th. So you probably know the work of Rebecca McKinnon. Um, Trevor Paglin is a UC Berkeley graduate. He's a geographer and a uh, visual artist. He's done really interesting work on, on visual surveillance and documenting um, CIA black sites according to FAA flight patterns. Um, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, so then we'll have a couple of panel presentations regarding policy and technology and um, a sort of artistic response to some, um, some of these policies. There's something called surveillance art that I had no idea about before <laughs> I started researching this. Is that, what, is that surveillance art up there in the corner? I don't know. Maybe that's surveillance graphic design. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, the examples that I had for today. I'd be happy to talk more about some of our other projects, but um, also happy to answer questions. And I thank you for your attention and interest.